Hi all, let's look at an amazing game for the US Chess Championships in round 8. Caden Troff was playing white against Hikaru Nakamura. Caden Troff is another young grandmaster, only 16 years old, born May the 6th, 1998. So at the time of this video, 16 years old. He was a US senior master in 2010. He was under 12 vice world champion. Uh, in 2011, he became a FIDE master. He was the world under 14 champion in 2012 as well. International master in 2012. Grandmaster in 2014, so just last year. So a newly minted uh, grandmaster. US chess junior champion in 2014. Top player under 18 in the Americas, January 2015. So let's see what Caden could do against Super Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura. D4, and we enter into after knight f6, c4, e6. What seems to be uh, promising to be a solid opening, like maybe a queen's engine. But there's different ways of playing this as black. A very, very solid approach would be d5. Um, queen's engine territory, or bogo b6, or bishop b4 check. Those are those kind of Queen's engine, Bogo engine type systems. But with c5, this is a statement inviting a transposition into the modern Benoni, which is a kind of controversial opening. It had its heyday in the 60s and 70s, and it was actually used quite frequently by Mikhail Tal, who I consider stylistically to be very similar to Nakamura. Nakamura is like a modern Mikhail Tal. So it's interesting how the new can kind of use the weapons of the old when they're the same sort of style of play. So Nakamura, he's you know going to be on the lookout for dynamic plans and fantastic sacrifices. So let's see, d5, the invitation is accepted to go into a Benoni structure. So in this structure, black has a queenside pawn majority, pressure on this e file. This d6 can be a weakness though. Often white is maneuvering like this to target that d6 pawn. So it's a double-edged opening, knight c3, g6. And white chooses now the Fianchetto variation, g3. So both sides Fianchetto their bishops and then castle, rook e8. And here, the old school method tried and tested is knight d2 in this position to head for c4 to start hitting that d6 pawn. But white plays rook e1, this is a slightly less popular approach, rook e1. We see a6, black can't be allowed with a6 to carry on with b5 that would be getting more control potentially over like the e4 square so the standard clamp down is just to play a4 here knight bd7 e4 and now we see this move knight g4 this is a common idea knight g4 in not just the bononi systems but also things like the benko gambit uh, often it's nice to try and improve Black's dark square control uh, to get rid of this f3 knight if that could be exchanged off. But also tactically, c4 and queen b6 immediately. That you know that those are tactical ideas as well. It's also inhibiting, of course, uh, some bishop moves. So white here plays knight d2, actually challenging that knight, and potentially, of course, there's knight c4 uh, to hit d6 here. So dual purpose. Black plays knight g e5, which stops knight c4. And also, if the knight's kicked, then knight d3 will be a nuisance. So actually, white defends the d3 square here. Black is actually potentially threatening knight d3. White plays the retreat, bishop f1, which might look a bit odd. If only the knight could be kicked, it will be embarrassed here. It had, has nowhere to go at the moment. So g5, the slight downside of g5 it's weakening some light squares. This is the key problem uh, with this sort of move. Although there's a dark square grip, these these light squares, if they can be exploited, um, that would be very interesting for white. Here, of course, you know this knight maneuver is ruled out the bishops on f1. If a knight could get in to f5, that would be really bad potentially for black. We see for the moment actually white being concerned now about g4 potentially and plays h3 perhaps against g4 to be able to take on g4. Queen f6, uh, putting some pressure on white's kingside immediately. Queen h5, 
actually preventing the cozy looking queen g6 for the moment and also of course it means maybe g5 is a bit looser potentially if the queen and bishop combine but now we have a strange looking move bishop h6 just defending that pawn in advance but also it carries with it the potential idea here that black might play g4 take on d2 and then play knight f3 check it's a bit crude but that does seem to be something to be concerned about here uh, white actually played knight d1 as though this maneuver is on the cards we have g4 now actually so this idea of taking on d2 is is now actually threatened white plays knight e3 and so knight f5 is, is horrible uh, that's actually taken so black volunteers the loss of his dark square bishop rook takes e3 and now queen g7 and with this vacating the f6 square means actually knight f6 now would try and trap that queen uh, you know after queen h4 you know the queen is ne very very nearly uh, trappable knight g6 queen g5 you know something like h6 where's the queen going after that so we we see here the queen actually being given an emergency escape route with h takes g4 the queen can now glide back like this if needed knight takes g4 attacking the rook the rook moves to c3 here knight d f6 hitting the queen and the queen goes to h1 protecting e4 and this is a pressure point of course for the moment you know nakamura seems to have a very active position very active aggressive but has he committed a cardinal sin here of giving up his dark square bishop it doesn't seem in this particular position that you know white's coordination is particularly strong that seems to be a striking aspect of the young uh, grandmasters that nakamura has faced it seems they're Peace coordination seems a little bit suspect here. You've got bishops still on the back row, rooks that don't seem to be particularly great. And Nakamura's rooks are ready to roll here, coordinating with the other pieces. So we see rook e5 ready to roll with rook h5. And seemingly, you know, some pressure points here around white's king are emerging. Queen f3 was played in advance of that. Uh, bishop d7 now and it has a slight symptom bishop d7 a slight issue here that this bishop and rook might actually coordinate here if white played rook b3 this might be an interesting test um, of black's resources and i think after the game nakamura was a bit concerned about this position for example you can imagine well rook b8 here there's bishop takes a6 now rook b3 wasn't played this this is, seems you know classic weakness of the last move but it turns out you know black here can possibly just go for an attack and there's a spectacular line an engine line i like to show you queen g6 so offering b7 rook h5 and you might think well, where is where's black going with this rook a3 we have rook e8 and say a move like this um well th th this is interesting um rook here then drops a4 so say a5 and there's a very interesting resource if we have this position where black's sacking this b pawn black has a phenomenal resource here which demonstrates that e file pressure of the benoni a little bit bishop f5 uh and if e takes rook takes f5 you can see that f2 is weak the rook and knight might be coordinating on f2 here and this position is is actually um, very very good for black with rook e1 coming there's going to be huge pressure on white so it shows black's position is not without resources even if b7 uh, was attacked that seems to be um, some commentators indicating this might be an idea but black seems to be uh, in good shape anyway here you see that, i mean these rooks just seem a little bit on the artificial side the, the, the forces aren't so well coordinated you see all of black's pieces trying to coordinate if b7 is lost then that's at the expense of of getting the rooks you know working together so um but it wasn't actually played here we see queen d3 being played queen h6 with not so subtle threat of queen h2 checkmate bishop g2 to parry that to give the king f1 but this is really dangerous now after king f1 
and actually a really crushing move is played in this position very well calculated very incisive the sort of move we'll be kicking ourselves in our own games quite often why don't we play it why don't we calculate it um, so if I give you five seconds here what would you play in this position so starting from now okay knight takes f2 really this sort of move undermines the white position it's a base pawn there's, there's a lot of things that are gonna collapse potentially because uh, it's kind of at the base of white's position we see king takes f2 so immediately we've got this pin so bishop h3 putting pressure on g2 white's on the defensive queen f1 and of course knight g4 is tempting but there's an even better move here that is played by Nakamura uh, can you see if I give you five seconds starting from now what does black play in this position Rook takes e4. This is really dangerous. Black can just double up rooks. And, you know, like in the previous round, Nakamura's rooks compared to his opponent's rooks uh, are absolutely fantastically coordinated here. And against White's king, uh, we see White in a very bad state here. He plays knight takes e4. After knight takes e4 check, king e3. Bishop takes g2 with tempo on the queen protecting the knight as well queen f4 as though there might be some check on g5 or g4 if, if white's not careful uh, but yeah black does risk that now with knight takes c3 he's winning some material he's going to be playing rook e8 soon we see this check but black doesn't have to play king h8 like in a previous game nakamura can escape any any perpetual checks king f8 and the white king and pieces just look uh, totally miserable here after rookie eight check all of these three pieces are coordinating quite well and white's had it king f2 and we see bishop h1 check basically mating it's a disaster mating next move if king f1 queen g2 checkmate so yeah white resigns after bishop h1 nakamura made it look easy here with with the Benoni defense it seemed like a lot of fun to accept this very dynamic pawn structure he's really played like the legend uh, a little bit you know he's like a new Mikhail Tau I've said that for quite some time I consider him one of my favorite players because he's very Tau like and he's used you know one of Tau's classic weapons uh, by transposition the modern Benoni I uh, hope you enjoyed that one comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much